In today's book review, we got Mind Reader by David J. Lieberman, deciphering what people really think, what they really want, and who they really are. If we rely on surface level assumptions, the opportunities to misread people are endless. I like to start with a couple examples like I made a mistake versus mistakes were made. When people blame things on the external them, that's showing that they don't take responsibility for anything and they're just putting blame on others versus when they say I, we, us, you're putting the blame on themselves and maybe your partner in crime, which they did the thing with. Uh, the funniest one is when sports teams win, they're like, oh, we won, let's go, even though they did nothing and watched. And then when they lose, they're like, they lose, they suck, I have nothing to do with them whatsoever. And then say, for example, when a parent, I've heard this many times with friends where it's like, yo, the parent, let's clean the house, it's our house. And then when it comes time to, oh, who made the rules around the house? Now it's my house, not yours at all. Those ones are hysterical in my opinion. Silence is golden. The less you say, the more control you have in what you say. Physical manifestations of anxiety include fidgeting, touching their face, picking our skin, rubbing our legs, playing with our fingers, face blushing, shaky voice, and body with difficulty swallowing. Traits would include frequency, duration, intensity, and context. Language, assertive, aggressive, passive aggressive, suppression, immobilization, and surrendering. We naturally sit closer and lean towards those who we want to connect with. If someone feels comfortable or uninterested, the opposite is true. So just think about it. Whoever you feel comfortable with most of the time, you want to hang out with them more. You want to do things. You'll be closer in proximity versus the opposite. People that are annoying and don't like, you'll try and stray and go farther and farther away from them consciously or subconsciously. Responding to an acquisition, how could I do such a thing versus no, I didn't do it. People that are telling the truth, no matter what happens, they're going to be completely direct and they're not going to have any sort of, you know, oh, I'm a good person and try to persuade you. They're just going to be direct. Real, I didn't do it like at all versus someone else who's like, how could I do such a thing? I'm so good with blank. And then they keep rambling on and on and on. Those who are innocent, they will always just be straightforward and honest. Uh, pontificating or philosophizing. I don't, don't want to say those two words, but kids these days don't understand. It shouldn't be this way. When they say things like that and start placing the blame again on this generation is different versus you kind of messed up and your way of thinking or doing is wrong in today's society. The guilty person wants the subject to change and the conversation to end. The innocent person always wants further exchange of information. Guilty people rarely claim responsibility. Innocent people do not hide their feelings or guilt or blame. You shouldn't have to sell the truth. It should speak for itself. People who bluff habitually overcompensate in either direction, and you can uncover a bluff instantly by noticing how someone tries to appear. So someone's right and they're not guilty at all. They're going to keep hammering and hammering until they find the root cause of a problem versus someone who's lying. You know, they're not going to do that at all. They're just going to say what they have to say. And then they don't want to keep going into detail because they're, they don't want to solve the truth. They don't want to tell people the truth. So they're not even able to say everything in order. Let's say, for example, someone's like, they start making up ideas in their head if they're lying. They're not going to be exactly how to recall things in order. It's going to kind of just say random information that happened throughout the day versus someone who, you know, is telling the truth. They're going to be able to kind of say exact details that actually matter to the plot. And they're going to remember everything because, you know, it actually happened to them. A person who has high self-esteem isn't the one going around showing the world how great he is. It's the insecure person who puts on air of superiority, drifting into arrogance and beyond to compensate for how he really feels about himself. And if someone already knows from himself, they don't need to tell anyone else or show anyone else because that person is secure. Instead of asking, how did you go to the movies? Ask two questions with a little detail. What movie did you watch and what time did the movie finish? So if you just ask, did you go to the movies? It's simple. They could just say yes in their line. But if you ask, what did you watch? And then what time you left? Those are way more intricate, detail-oriented questions that are open-ended that can lead the person into saying different things. And you can be like, yo, oh, I heard there was construction in this place and took forever to get there. Even though if you just made that up and the person's like, oh, yes, then that other person is probably lying. Watch out for establishing authority. We believe those in authority when it comes to doctors, teachers, police officers, then someone stun you, paralyzing your thought process with overwhelming fear or excitement, reinforcing credibility like the yes, yes. So if you ask two questions like, and it can be something very general like, oh, 
Is your name, let's say for example, let's go for me. Is your name Alex? Yes. Do you live on one, two, three blank street? And then I say yes. After you say two yeses, you're more likely to say yes to the next thing. So if they did that, and then they went on to go say whatever else they said, you're more likely to believe them because their authority, they stunned you with something crazy, like a crazy offer that has fear or excitement, and they're getting you to say yes, yes. So when they do all these different things in combination, it's like the perfect recipe in order to manipulate someone. And then they go on to tell a story because you know what, we, we're we big fans of learning things and, learn, and knowing things. When someone's really good at telling a story, we get way more involved or way more likely to believe things than someone just saying exactly what happened. Connection, deception, you're like me and you like me. Like attracts like, similarities and commonalities. People who share similar experiences can become instant friends. The me too, I have the same blank. So you gotta watch out for people. If someone's like, just asks you, oh, what do you like? And then they're like, oh, me too in every single area. Or it's like, oh, I have that in common as well. We love seeing ourselves in other people. That's why we're drawn towards people that are exactly like us for the most part. Flattery gets you nowhere. It couldn't be further from the truth. Our number one emotional need is feeling connection with the other humans. When we have trust, however, negative thoughts do not fill our mind. They, the trust accelerator when a personal or when a person shares private aspects of her life, first sharing creates unearned trust. When someone opens up to you, they think, oh, this person trusts me, then I should be able to trust them. And you'll be moved on to reciprocate because it's only fair. When someone gives you something like time, information, or a gift, you often feel indebted to the other person. So I'm not saying you don't have to do these things, but there can a manipulator would know how to do all these things in combination, and it wouldn't be the greatest to just show up everything right away to another person. Although, in my opinion, when you trust every person until they wrong you is probably the better way because 95% of people aren't trying to do anything bad. Connectors versus confronters. What is the answer? What do you think the answer is? So when you say things more directly rather than just, you know, saying like that, like a salesman for the most part, they're like, they don't just say, oh, what kind of car do you want to buy? They're like, oh, do you want the red car or the blue car? They make the person pick which one rather than just giving an open-ended. People tend to find whatever they are looking for and what they expect to see. Jumping to conclusions to a as a hammer to everything looks like a nail. So you don't want to jump to conclusions every single time. You want to have that balance between intuition and logical thinking. But when you go on intuition with bias, that's completely different from just listening to your heart and what there really is. Bringing awareness to our bias helps neutralize their impact and enhances our ability to evaluate the other person or situation objectively. Only the exceptional person is willing to look at what they don't want to see and listen to, what they don't want to hear and believe in, that which they do not want to exist. The greater our ego, the more vulnerable we feel, and the greater our drive to predict and con control the world. When we refuse to blame everything external besides over us. The things you love and hate about others are the things you love and hate about yourself. People are a reflection of who you are. So all the good you like in other people are the good you like in yourself. All the things you hate about the other person, those are all what you don't like about yourself. When we take notice of how other people see themselves and their world, what attracts their attention and what they avoid, what they mention and what they miss, what they condemn and what they defend and accept and reject, we know their story, the what they focus on and see tells you why they focus on it and why tells you who they really are. When confronted with the discrepancy between our narrative and reality, the ego engages any number of defense mechanisms to distort reality. The integrity of our narrative must be preserved. We lie to ourselves and solve and can live with ourselves, or we can't live with ourselves. We distort or delete aspects of our world to mitigate their unpleasurable effects from a conscious awareness. The most common of these is avoidance, denial, and justification, like a smoker not thinking about it, disrupting or denying the evidence, justifying one smoking as a bus could hit me tomorrow, accepting the truth, and taking steps to quit even if repeatedly unsuccessful. The person always needs to be right in control and power. This is why it is hard for them to forgive and apologize. The same is true for those who cannot let go or worse, they seek revenge. Beware of the person who never says sorry. He is weak and frightened at will. Sometimes as the slightest provocation, fight will be the desperate fierce variety like a cornered animal. So that person is very weak. They'd just be willing to strike back whenever. Looking through the glass, someone cutting you off in traffic could be an emergency room going into a hospital. 
rather than just, oh, this person cut me off, they're such a bad person. You gotta see things from their point of view. Maybe they're in a rush for something that's actually important. Once we have fully accepted something about ourselves or our lives, we no longer need to hide it from the world and we don't care what people know about or find out about. And we don't allow the reality to hold us back. The truth, once embraced, can never be bruised or injured, yet the delusion can be shattered by a whisper or a glance. Everything that irritates us about others can be lead us to a better understanding of ourselves. Many of us are aware that when we are both bothered or when we are bothered by a fault in others, it is because we share this weakness. Empathy requires a shift in perspective to put yourself in another person's proverbial shoes. Detachment is the nuclear option of defense mechanisms for dealing with either suppressed or repressed anxiety. So that was one thing I used to do for a while was completely detach yourself from whatever it is when that's not really facing the problem. That's just kind of giving up. And granted, you can use that in certain situations where you can't control things, but for the majority part, you don't want to detach. You want to face every problem and fear head on to actually get rid of it or else you're just, again, suppressing it. Five domains when people talk about themselves, character traits, their relationships, their possessions, their physical attributes, their profession or skill. The value of meaning, authentic, sustainable happiness, let alone mental health is found in our connection to reality, not to escape from it. The more meaning something has, the greater the pleasure. The pursuit of the comfort is basically the avoidance of life and not only denies us genuine pleasure, but also short circuits the entirety of our well-being. Studies confirm that those who place a high priority on money and fame are significantly less happy and emotionally solvent than those who strive meaning into their lives by pursuing healthy relationships, developing their potential, and becoming involved in social causes. If you plan on being anything less than you are capable of being, then you will probably be unhappy and angry all of the days in your life. So when you actually find purpose in something that's really hard, it actually becomes more enjoyable because you know you're working towards something that actually matters versus doing all those things to short-term pleasure that doesn't really gratify or sense you at all. The fuel required to give one's life meaning, impulse control, self-esteem, emotional health, and long-term gratification. Those who punish themselves disguised as pleasure, excessive eating, binge drinking, drug abuse, and endless other distractions. They substitute illusions for love. Over time, to varying degrees of self-awareness or guilt and shame, compounds self-sabotage and turns into self-harm. Every time we watch movies, TV shows, social media, and video games, we mute the uncomfortable noise of the self-reflection and raise the volume of illusion because you're distracting yourself. How can you ever think about your problems and find solutions? You can sit in a room for 30 minutes with a pen, paper, and just your thoughts and figure out everything, but you're too busy distracting yourself with something new, consumerism, buying a new object, listening to music, watching a TV show, watching a movie, playing a sport, hanging out with friends. You have no time for solitude and actually reflecting on your problems or issues. How far can you go into the forest? You can only go halfway. Balance exercise is a positive, healthy attribute. However, running with a broken foot because you get your exercise in is not a good sign. So everything always requires a balance. If you are doing something to an extent, I used to do that. I used to work out when I had problems with my body and I wasn't listening to it. And that only drove me further and further away from how to feel actually good. In search of sanity, does a person have a balanced outlook on life's priorities or does he blow every little thing out of proportion while perhaps ignoring the main things? To the emotionally unwell person, every little thing is a big thing. You can see this in so many people when you become aware of it and it's hysterical. It's like, dude, you're complaining about something when you're not facing all of your fears and anxieties and the things that actually matter in your life. It's like, if you put energy into that, you could have solved your problems, but instead you're freaking out about the one thing you have no control over, which is hysterical. Level one is the judge, level two, judge and jury, level three, judge, jury, and executioner. When a person has humility, they are fulfilled. When we don't like who we are, we cannot help but become angry with ourselves. Then we take it out on the world and the people around us and who we care about the most. Inferiority complex, Sykes' attempt to compensate for our insecurities often shares the entirety of our lives and we hide our true selves to feel safe. Being authentic, true us to who we are and makes us vulnerable and exposes us to the risk of rejection. The fear of this pain drives the real eye deeper into hiding until we exist only to protect our image. 
This includes all the games we play and the masks that we wear to provide the rest of the world and then what we believe is the right person to be. The one that will make us worthy of being loved. Submissive types become people pleasers. Dominant types seek power, fame, and money in being assertive, aggressive, and controlling. Confidence without humility equals arrogance. The last ditch effort for the ego defense mechanism is laughing the pain away when someone says something that roots hurts so much where there's nothing to do besides laugh at it. The cycle of giving and receiving is the perfect union. Giving excites the brain. When we only take, however, we are left feeling empty. Every positive emotion stems from giving and flows outward from us to others, while every single negative emotion revolves around taking. Do not confuse a lust for love. When we lust after someone or something, we think in terms of what they or it can do for us. When we love, however, our thoughts are immersed in what we can give to someone else. Giving makes us feel good, so we do it happily. But when we lust, we only want to take. When someone we love is in pain, we feel the pain. When someone we love or when someone we lust after is in pain, we think of only in terms of how that loss or inconvenience means to us. When you give out of guilt or fear, it is not the same. Intelligence is the ability to learn from your mistakes and wisdom is the ability to learn from the mistakes of others. How does one speak or present about past relationships with people? Only a person who truly has self-respect will treat himself and others well. Not so that they will like him, but because it is the right thing to do. The best question to ask other people is an open-ended question about his or her last job, their bosses, and their co-workers. If they start saying all these negative things, it's most likely because that person is not a good person. Or rarely do they have every, their boss is bad, their co-worker is bad, and their job is bad. That's one of the best questions that I literally ask anyone. Be on alert for the two-faced person with an inconsistent personality when they act different between different jobs, different people, and they start switching up. You can really see this with girls and guys when it comes to a guy acting different between his boys and then when he's out and then sees a girl act completely different. That is not good. You should act the same 24-7 no matter where you're at. And again, people are only human. Most people are going to be two-faced, especially around family, friends, and other people. Is the person a man of their word, morals, or commitments show up on time? Healthy boundaries are not created to keep people out, but rather to define our space and oversense our personal responsibility. A manipulator will make you feel shame. They'll remind you of how bad you really are, and they'll be really convincing as well. People feeling anxious or sad may actually avoid using the words in order to hide their true feelings from others. Someone suffering from the extreme depression may sadly attempt suicide to leave the physical world. Someone suffering from psychosis stays in the physical world but abandons reality. Superstition is nothing but a diluted form of psychosis, the desire to make connections where none exist. In any situation where you feel something is just not right, trust your instincts. When people talk, listen completely. Most people never listen. So hopefully you can take that. I really like the second half of the book. It just started going off about just Carfax. And you can really read people so much better when you, obviously it's gonna be really hard to take all of that in and do all of it, but when you work on it every single day and you become more aware 100% in the moment and read people's body language, the tonality of voice, the facial expressions, and then you start adding on like things like, I never really paid attention to when people use we, us, they, them, and not using certain words, when that could definitely help in the beginning when some people might be really good at keeping the vibes good and stuff when there's those little, little, tiny, tiny, little differences. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Other than that, it's your boy. Have a good day and deuces.